We welcome you to our service this evening. This is the first in our midweek series of Lenten services. Our thoughts this year are going to revolve around following Jesus, especially with the aspect of his wondrous love for us. This evening, we're a little bit late getting started. We had some technical difficulties that were here. So we may adjust the service a little bit. For you who are online, uh, please follow along. and. Um, you who are here with us today, we just have a few that are with us because of the snow situation and the weather that we've been having. So I'm going to ask you to sing rather loudly this evening and to follow along in your service bulletin. And at this time, I'd ask those who are here to please rise. And if you would join with me in the invocation and the opening prayer, responsibly as you find it printed in your bulletin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. We gather tonight and during this Lenten season to commemorate the wondrous love Jesus Christ has for us. What wondrous love it is as we recall Jesus' suffering to remove the dreadful curse in our sinful souls. Our record is shameful. Like others before us, we have turned away from the Lord and denied him. We have accused and deserted him. We have refused to serve both him and the people he would have us care for. Because, because of our many sins, we stand, we stand guilty before God, unable to erase one of our crimes or, or to avoid even part of their punishment. By our disobedience, we have earned for ourselves a lifetime of trials and an eternity of torment. But the wondrous love of Jesus comes to our rescue. The sinless Son of God offered himself as our substitute before God's judgment. He humbled himself for us, taking all our sins and their punishment on his holy self. For us, Jesus endured temptation by Satan, betrayal and denial by his disciples, the injustice of his trials, the mocking and abuse of his tormentors, the bitter pains of crucifixion, and worst of all, the terrible wrath for sin of his Father. We pray that this love will work genuine repentance in our hearts this Lenten season. We pray that we will ponder anew the love of Christ who cherishes our souls more deeply than we do and endured our punishment more severely than we can measure in order to save us. Be with us, Lord, as we follow you from the upper room to Gethsemane, to the courts of the Sanhedrin and Pontius Pilate, to the cross and the tomb. Help us pay close attention to all that you say and do on your mission of rescuing love. Impress on our hearts and minds the precious meaning of your passion. Increase our faith and strengthen our grasp on the eternal life you have won for us. Move us to respond to your love with a deeper love for you and a stronger devotion to carry out your will in our lives. Grant this to us and bless us as we worship tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. And the congregation may be seated as we continue with the singing of our opening hymn, Jesus, I will ponder now. Hymn number 98 in Christian worship, a Lutheran hymn, though. We'll sing stanzas one through four. <laughs>
It is our custom during the Lenten season to read the entire Passion history. So we will be doing that over the next several weeks. This evening, the Passion history begins with Jesus on Monday, Thursday evening, as he celebrates the Passover and then the Lord's Supper with his disciples. The festival of unleavened bread, which is also called the Passover, was approaching. Jesus said to his disciples, you know that after two days it will be the Passover, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. They plotted together how to arrest Jesus in some deceitful way and to kill him. But they said, not during the festival, or else there might be a riot among the people. Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and spoke with the chief priests and officers of the temple guard about how he could betray Jesus to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. He promised to do it and was looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them away from the crowd. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of them and said to them, Go into the city, and there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. They went and found things just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table with the twelve apostles. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the end. By the time the supper took place, the devil had already put the idea into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He got out from the supper and laid aside his outer garment. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, You do not understand what I am doing now, but later you will understand. Peter told him, You will never wa wash my feet. Jesus replied, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Lord, then not just my feet, Simon replied, but also my hands and my head. Jesus told him, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet, but his body is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Indeed, he knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, Not all of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet and put on their outer, his outer garment, he reclined at the table again. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. You are right, because I am. Now if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I have given you an example so that you also will do just as I have done for you. Amen. Amen, I tell you. A servant 
is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. He took a cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. While they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread with me in the dish. Indeed, the Son of Man is going to go just as it has been written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Amen, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples were looking at each other, uncertain which of them he meant. One of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining at Jesus' side. Simon Peter motioned to him to find out which one Jesus was talking about. So leaning back against Jesus' side, he asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus replied, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread after I have dipped it in the dish. Then he dipped the piece of bread and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do more quickly. None of those reclining at the table understood why Jesus said this to him. Because Judas kept a money box, some thought that Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. After Judas left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. While they were eating on the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples. He said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Dear children, I am going to be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, love one another just as I have loved you, so also you are to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, Where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus replied, Will you really lay down your life for me? Simon, Simon, pay attention. Satan has asked to have you all so that he may sift you like wheat. But I pray for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brothers. Peter answered him, Even if all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Amen, I tell you, tonight, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. 
Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the disciples said the same. And this evening, that is where we end with the reading of the Passion History. We continue with the singing of our next hymn, Hymn 120, in the Christian Worship Hymnal, What Wondrous Love Is This? meeting, 
you're in an accident. You survive the accident with hardly ever a scratch upon you. But the two who said that they were going to hurt you and take you before this crowd are badly injured. They're barely alive. What would you do? Would you escape, escape from there as fast as you can, leaving the men to suffer similar in a way that they had intended to hurt you? It would take an amazing amount of love to show mercy to them and to take care for them, don't you think? Now, maybe that's a bit extreme, but perhaps it could better help us understand what this wondrous love of the Savior in the upper room the night before he was crucified is about. Later, he was going to be blindfolded. He was going to be hit. He was going to be spit upon. He was going to be mocked. He was going to be whipped and then finally put to death. Yet before all of that happened, he showed wondrous love to two men who were very close to him who hurt him very badly. One betrayed him, the other would deny him. This evening as we follow in his wondrous love for us, we see how it's displayed for us in that upper room. The very fact that Jesus was in that place that we call the upper room where he met with his disciples for that last Passover meal that, in the first place, shows us what his wondrous love is about. Early here, had sent some of his disciples into the city to find a place where he could have that Passover meal. The last one with his friends would be the last time that he was going to eat that Passover meal with them. He told them all very plainly that now was the time that he was going to leave them, that he was going to be put to death. He knew that the next day he was going to shed his blood on the cross for everyone's sins. That wouldn't be easy, that wouldn't be pleasant. He also knew that in order to get that started, one of these 12 disciples had to betray him. He knew it was Judas. I wonder what Jesus was thinking when he was eating this last meal with that disciple close by. What would you have thought if you were eating a meal with someone who was going to betray you and you knew everything about it? What might you have said? Maybe we would say something like, Judas, I know what you are planning to do and I'm not going to let you do that. And if you had the power that Jesus had, maybe you would seek to destroy him in just saying a few words. Jesus could do that. But instead, he warned him in a very special way. He said, the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. And woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. You could say that was a warning, but really it was a beckoning. It was a beckoning for this disciple to return to Jesus in repentance before it was too late. Think of what wondrous love that is that's displayed in this upper room as Jesus predicted the disciple and his action of betraying him. In one sense, it ought to bring us to our knees in humble awe of the Savior who loves all of his disciples so much that he gives warnings to them when he sees them going their way, their way apart from him. Now it's easy to go another way. It's actually easier to go another way than it is to follow him. And in the weakness of our flesh, it's easy to give up God for the enticements of the world that are around us. And then, like Judas, we betray him. Yet Jesus continues to hold out to us this wondrous love. It's 
purpose is to stop us in our tracks in this case. That's what he's doing in the upper room where he predicted Judas' betrayal. In effect, he was saying, Judas, don't do it. Don't do it. For I came to live and to take care of your sins too. I came to show my love for you. Don't do this. Return to me. See, that's the wondrous love of the Savior that we see in a special way. First in the upper room. May we follow in that and apply that then to our lives of faith. There's another thing that happened that evening while they were in the upper room. It shows us once more this wondrous love of the Savior reaching out to those who were closest to him. Next, Jesus turned his attention to Peter. By now, they were about to leave that upper room and they were headed out to the Garden of Gethsemane where he was going to spend his time in prayer. And as he had known what Judas was going to do, so he also knew what Peter would do. And he said things to him also. He started by giving them all some very ominous news. That very night, all of them were going to run away. They were going to desert him. They would flee from him as they felt that their own lives were in danger. But that was going to lead to something worse. Turning to Peter ahead of time, Jesus predicted this disciple's denial. He said, this very night before the rooster crows, you are going to disown me three times. Peter was shocked. Confident of himself, Peter proclaimed, Lord, I will never do that. Not me. Even if all the rest of them should run away from you, even if I have to die with you, I'm not going to disown you. And all the rest of the disciples said the same thing. Now as true Lord, Jesus knows all things. He knew exactly what lay ahead for Peter and what he would do. And when Peter, in the boldness of his human flesh, made a boast in the opposite direction of what he would really do, Jesus could have struck out again at another disciple who didn't follow him. But he didn't. Instead, just like with Judas, Jesus leaves a loving warning with Peter, calling Peter also to return to him before it was too late. See the wondrous love of the Savior? Even though he knows all of his disciples and he knows the weaknesses of their sinful flesh, he does lose his cool with them. Instead, he holds out his hands, inviting them to return to him, no matter what was going to take place in their lives. Neither a planned betrayal or an unplanned denial is too much that a sinner cannot return to the Savior who will receive him back in forgiveness. Paul writes much later than this, God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And the Apostle John adds, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Sometimes those truths seem almost incomprehensible to us. Because we know that God knows how weak we are and how sinful we can be. He not only knows what we are like, he already knows what we are going to do even before we do it. He knows that there are times that we will betray him. He knows that there are times we will go a different way because it will gain us in this world. He knows that there are times that we will deny him. And he knows the pressure that can be placed upon us at times can be so great to deny. Yet in the wondrous love that Jesus has, he just gently and very calmly calls us back to him and readily forgives us. That's the reason he died on the cross, to 
to take away that sin. And that's the reason we follow him. No matter what others might think or what others might say of us, we have a Savior who doesn't hate us for the weaknesses and the temptations into which we so easily fall. He doesn't hate us for the things that we think or we say against him. Instead, in his wondrous love, he calls us to return. Return to him who will forgive us. And he calls us to continue following him. In that love, we find strength to carry on. And we live our lives for him. God grant that always in our lives of faith for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now we continue with the singing of our next hymn as we prepare to receive the supper this evening. Hymn number 309. Draw near and take the body of the Lord. confession or personal confession, we ask you to speak those parts that are in the bold print listed for you. In the name of our God, to whom all hearts are open, and from whom no secrets are hidden, amen. O Lord, hear my prayer, listen to my cry for mercy, and in your faithfulness come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. 
Do not hide your face from me, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. And we continue. Almighty God and merciful Father, I, a troubled and repentant sinner, confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. I have not loved you with all my heart. I have not loved others as I should. I am distressed by the sins that trouble me, and I am deeply sorry for them. And we take a moment of silence to consider our faults before him. Jesus says to his people, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? If so, then answer, yes, yes I, I believe. believe. And because of the promise of our Savior Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. O Lord, my God, I call to you for help, and you answered me. I thank you for the love you have shown me in Jesus Christ, my Savior. Through him you have rescued me from the guilt of my sin and given me the peace of forgiveness. Help me fight against temptation, correct whatever wrongs I can, and serve you and those around me with love and good works. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And we go in peace. The Lord is with us. We join together in the prayer the Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You who are with us this evening, we now invite you to come forward to receive the Lord's Supper. I think we could take you all at one time. So if you would just come up here and line up and position yourselves a little bit apart from each other. body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. body and blood have given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins. Strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
and we pray. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commands. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Stanzas 1, 6, 7, and 8. Hymn 588, Abide With Me. Please note the stanzas we sing. series of midweek Lenten services and then you who are online you can join us again this coming Sunday at nine o'clock as we still will be broadcasting on Facebook uh, our service on Sunday morning so we pray that the Lord go with you in the week that lies ahead and then the weekend and uh, stay safe and warm and God bless your work in him thank you mm -hmm.